Genocides don't end the moment they are stopped by force. The forces that create and lead to genocides do not end the moment the genocide stops. At the point at which we are able to make glorification of these people who commit genocides harder, we are able to reduce future acts of violence, future possible genocides. Very, very proud to propose. What do we think this looks like? We think a few things. First of all, it means simple biographical information, images, are basically removed or not stated to be like the actual name. This means Hitler wouldn't be named in a textbook about World War II, simply that a guy from Bavaria led a certain country. <laughs> I think it's crucial to note that by perpetrators, we don't just mean the leader of a genocide. So not just you know a specific politician in Rwanda or in or Pol Pot in Cambodia. We also include this to individual foot soldiers. If you're a general in the SS, your name will also be removed if you partook in genocide. I'll explain why that's important in a second argument. Our first argument, then, is simply about how you make glorification harder, glorification. you reduce, sure. Yeah, so would you also not say the country that person is from? Would this just be like a case study? Uh, not necessarily, because we don't think everyone in the country partook in it. We just want specific people who actively either directed the genocide or took part in it. Why do we think making glorification harder is important? The reason, the first reason, is because genocide doesn't happen in a vacuum, and just because a genocide has been stopped doesn't mean the effects of it or potential future ones don't. Why is this the case? Because people who supported the genocide, or people who, who experienced it but weren't the victims, but were perhaps part of the system that led to it, still exist. So in Nazi Germany, post-war, there were plenty of people who were former Nazi party members who were pro-Hitler. What this means is that the sentiment behind it still persists even after the genocide perpetrator is dead or prosecuted in court. We think that we ought to make sure that those people cannot use the memories in order to, and the memories of that person in question to perhaps keep their movement alive, to keep that ideology that's so toxic going. This is key. The team that is best able to dispel these like neo-genocidal rhetoric, these neo-genocidal movements, is a team that is going to win this debate. Why then are we able to do this? Genocide perpetrators play a key role, the memory of them plays a key role in keeping genocidal sentiment alive. Why is this the case? Because genocidal sentiment is often based on views of the past. It's based on past rhetoric, past narratives about struggles, about you know, a certain group being bad for you, which is why you have to exterminate them. This is especially problematic at the point at which you have someone who actually partook in it, someone who actually enacted it, someone like Hitler actually putting fascist rhetoric into practice. What this means is, no thank you, what this means is in after the genocides have been perpetrated, neo-fascist groups, for instance, are able to use memories of Hitler, to use his ideology, to use him and his symbols as a powerful rallying point. This has practical implications, and we think we mitigate that to a certain extent. First of all, these movements actually use like literal symbols of them as a rallying point to organize, to spread their message using the aesthetics or the actual location. For many years, people used Hitler's like death place at the Führer bunker as a place to rally around, to actually organize people. They're clear indications of the past. They allow you to mobilize and get there. But in a more like nebulous sense, when it's not actually a specific location, but when it's just the person <coughs> himself or herself, well, we think the issue with that is similar. We are still able to mitigate their influence at the point at which they get wiped out from the history textbooks. It's much, much, it's much harder to personalize them, to even have some comprehension of what they meant, of how they were able to get, uh, to how they were able to get so much power. When the personal impact is taken away, we think education improves, which leads into our, our second impact in this argument. Education is key. Education, like denazification, for instance, is how you remove genocidal sentiment. We think education improves at the point at which you bring this Roman practice into uh, common, into the fold. Why is this the case? Because education right now, we think, is flawed. It often focuses on the person involved. When you study World War II, you look at Hitler as a unique person, as someone who is directly responsible for the acts that happened because of their charisma or their rhetoric or their ideology. Why is this problematic? Because we don't think that you know, genocides are just because of one person, but rather because of various sentiments, various structural reasons that one person seizes upon. That is to say, Hitler is replaceable. Maybe a Holocaust would still happen just with a different person at the helm. Why do we think we cover this better? Because when you can't just focus all your attention on one person, you still have to answer the question of why this genocide happens, which means you look at other things. You look at like cultural sentiments, like stereotypes about Jewish people pre-Hitler. You look at ideas that political parties use. You see how we actually, how this movement was built because you're not focused on the man. You're focused on the, the way they got to power, the way the genocide was conducted. Crucially, 
I think that this only happens at the point at which you get rid of this person in the way uh, the Romans described. Because it is simply far, far easier for educational systems in the country where the genocide happened, or abroad, to take the easy route out, which is to just focus on the one individual themselves. People take the short route out. We want to make them look at the uncomfortable truths, which help, A, prevent genocide in the country where this happened, because they're looking at structural reasons their people supported this person. But B, across the globe, it removes the narrative that it can't happen here. Because now it's on a question of one unique German or one unique Cambodian phenomenon. On. It's actually the structural reasons that are much, much beyond. No thanks. Uh, that one place. The second argument is a principled one. We don't think death is enough punishment. Two reasons for it. First of all, there are two aspects of criminal justice that we're trying to balance here. The first is retribution, and the second is rehabilitation. Rehabilitation is not possible. These people tend to be dead, and they tend to be way beyond the fold. <laughs> but second of all, Simply put, one death is not enough to make up for millions of lives. It's not a question of a mass murder. It's far, far beyond that. Millions of people have been taken away, millions of families, millions of legacy. It's not a normal crime. That is to say, simply going for the death punishment or the capital punishment as a possible, a possible alternative isn't enough. And I'll tell you why. Because quite often, these people look forward to that. They say that being a martyr is justified. They're willing to die for their cause so long as you know, it, it has had some practical impact. That is to say, they're not concerned about any sort of other punishment because they know their legacy will persist, the toxic legacy of their genocidal ideology. This is key. Given that we've proven to you that we mitigate, we reduce the genocidal, the, the after effects of the genocidal ideology, we think this is the only way to get that retribution. Because you take the, the thing away that these genociders are willing to take, that is their legacy, because they know it'll pass on, it'll continue after them. We strip that from them, we deny them the ability to persist, we deny the thing they want the most. The last point here, and it's a, a bit of a mix of both arguments, is on individual participants. I think a soldier in Nazi Germany, in the SS, is now seriously concerned. Because now it's not just a question of following orders, it's a knowledge that at the point at which you might be committing a crime, your whole existence is wiped out as a perpetrator of genocide. We think that's a much more powerful deterrent than simply saying you might be put on prosecution, you might be prosecuted in, in a criminal court, you might be known as someone who participated. At the point at which we deliver retribution, at the point at which we actually get justice and we make glorification harder, very proud to propose. Thank you. Okay. The issue with Gug case is that we don't always agree upon when somebody is a perpetrator of genocide or not. For I'm going to go into two points. First, on accountability. Second, on how we should teach history accurately, how genocide is not anonymous. Then I'm going to go into reputation to be here from Gug Edge. Let's talk about accountability. The first thing I want to note is that people often disagree on whether someone is a perpetrator of genocide or not. For example, Bogadeshi sees Winston Churchill as a perpetrator of genocide because he starved the country and millions of people. The British, however, see him as a hero. They have statues of him around London. So what's really going to happen when we impose a nation memorial upon these perpetrators of genocide? It is going to be the victims of these genocide that put his name in anonymity. And so the name Winston Churchill will live on in clear history because people that are in Britain don't recognize him as a perpetrator of genocide. What they recognize him as is somebody who did things for the war, uh, for, for conquest, and did things in an honorable manner because it was the ends all justified the means. It was not genocide in the end. It didn't matter. It was just some random starvation. Currently, there's a lot of debates over whether Churchill did or didn't commit genocide. These arguments exist in academic and public discourse on his legacy. This no longer exists on proposition because the only history they have, the proper records that we have, are erased. The people that were the most damaged by his legacy, that was Churchill, are no longer going to be able to speak about the facts that he starved millions of people. What happens then on prop? We say that there's no more accountability for these people, that they're lived on in glory because the names that are need to be attached to the genocidal history are no longer attached to this history. They're instead attached to doing things like, I don't know, be really brave in World War II, like big props, I don't know, I don't care. Look, let's just look at a current example. Is Aung San Suu Kyi a perpetrator of genocide? Some would say yes and some would say no. But those that would say yes are never going to talk about it in the long run. We think that the memorability of a name is important because it provides responsibility. It says this person was culpable for the people that have died, that your family was killed by this specific individual. It's not just, for example, the leaders. It is also the foot soldiers that Vic says in his model. And I think that actually really like, you know, ruins their case because it is the foot soldiers that d directly harm people. People want to have somebody to pin point the blame upon. We think that's important for people to feel the sense of justice. They know who has harmed them. They know how they can pursue justice. They know that his name is going to be recognized in history as somebody who has hurt your family. 
We say that the memorability of the name fulfills the fun function of social shaming. The context of which perpetrators of genocide are spoken about is somewhat obviously despicable. We say that these people, these names should be attached to shame and to deep, we should despise these names. We should continue this. We should say that these individuals have harmed people greatly. We should look at them and shame them and say that this is something that we should never forget. And it's very easy to forget an anonymous face. You're not going to remember who exactly it was. You're not going to see the specificity of the details of who hurt who. And we think that's important. This is how we get justice. This is how we get reparations. We cannot get reparations if we're not specific because we don't know whose culture it was that was exact damage. Of what culture, like, sorry, of what culture they came from. Um, it's very difficult for us to target which exactly, what countries, what regions deserve to give reparations to other countries. We think that this is only possible if you have these <coughs> direct exact names, the states that are attached to these people, because it also should again be published. It should be public. The damages of an individual upon another are not just individualized. It's not just financial. It's not just you know some restitution you have on an individual. We say that they should be socially shamed. That anyone connected to these people should know about it. That perhaps they have peers in the long run. For example, you might be your ancestors. You should know this. You should know their names. Second argument of teaching history. Genocide is not anonymous. We should learn how they begin and how they end. Adolf Hitler was born as just some guy, and it's important to name him for what he was. He was some guy that gained power. For example, let's look at the Me Too movement. It was important for us to list names and to specifically say these names because it personalized the pervasive issue of sexual assault. That it wasn't some impersonal specter of sexual assault that hurt people. Rather, people's peers, their coworkers, their friends, their brothers that hurt other people. And we say an anonymous perpetrator of genocide is depersonalized. We cannot recognize a faceless image as evil. And we cannot recognize ourselves and our, our biases and our racist cultures and, and, and our racist tendencies if we do not have the specific names, because names personalize people. You can say that some foot soldier, for example, was a perpetrator of genocide. But that doesn't mean anything to you, right? You personally might not be some random foot soldier. But if it is a name that is a person with a family and a culture and an upbringing and perhaps, like, you know, various neurotic tendencies that you might also relate to. We think that is what matters. You can recognize the fact that genocides happen quite pervasively, that they happen through cultures that perpetrate the issues of like hegemony and dominance over other people. And you can only recognize yourself in this kind of violence if you see them as regular day people. And you cannot if they have no names. Because you see somebody that's unnamed as some ambiguous, some vague specter. It doesn't mean anything to you. We say it's important to learn the specific political and psychological context of which genocide and evil is committed. It is almost easy to commit genocide then if they're just some random individuals to be swept up in the banality of evil. If we do not list their names in the history books, but they are unnamed, they're dehumanized, we think it's impossible for us to recognize ourselves and these people that have done so much harm. I'll take from closing go. Oh, sure. All of the information about victims, exactly who was victimized and how, mm -hmm. will remain on our side, okay. so there's no delta for reparations. Yeah. Yes, there is, because perhaps it is a vic but the victims want to know who exactly it was. They want their family to know who exactly it was that hurt them. We think it's specificity and important, because trauma is personal. It is not, again, a specific, random, like, ambiguous German person that harmed you and your family. It is a specific individual. Let's go into reputation to what we hear from Gut Bench. Gut says that, uh, one, we should stop focusing on just one individual because it's not just one individual that perpetrates genocide. And then in the model they say, we're also going to anonymize all the foot soldiers that came in and you know harm people. So clearly what happens is that there's like some focus on, you know, some, it, it's not just one individual, right? It's it, perhaps some like vague idea of like, you know, cultural differences or like, you know, white supremacy. But the thing is, this just isn't true. Like oftentimes, this, uh, these ideas of a cultural supremacy are perpetrated through structures of governance with specific individuals within these structures of governance that have that encourage these narratives within our history books of supremacy over other cultures. Again, I think it is important for us to target these individuals. And also, just to be clear, it is ridiculous to argue that people think it was just one individual that caused all of the Holocaust, right? Like we know that that's not true. Second then, in response to what they say on how we should like stop people from moderating themselves, that the perpetrators of genocide are willing to die for the cause and can change that by erasing their names from history. Really? I don't think that is true at all. I think realistically, one, there's no change because if you're already going to commit a genocide, like shit, I don't know man, what's gonna change? What we're really going to care about are the average, you know, foot soldiers they talk about, the average Nazi soldier or majority group in uh, or majority group wasn't concerned with being swept up in the history, uh, sorry, aren't going to be as concerned in being implicated in the fact that they did extreme damages to other people. If we know that they're going to be named, they know that they're going to be caught on the wrong side of the history books. They're going to be afraid for the legacy of their family and their family name, which means they're less likely to cooperate under the banality of evil. We say they're more likely to strike out, to know that they're going to be personally implicated, and we say we're proud to oppose.
the ways in which we understand genocide and the status quo miseducate people about how they start, and they misunderstand the fundamental basis of them. But more importantly, you, the, uh, we are the only side to prove to you why you are less likely to get a genocide in the future. We are the only group that proves to you why principally this is necessary. And I'm going to be going more into that in this speech. What do we hear from opening opposition? First, we hear the idea of accountability. I think that this is uh, like just kind of like mischaracterized in a few ways. First of all, I think that we do have metrics within the status quo to determine whether genocide is perpetrated. There are courts that deem these things. You know, after the Holocaust, there were the Nuremberg trials. We have methods to do this. But even if you were to say that, like, you know, some someone would be accused of a genocide and and like in our worst case and, and you know not have done it and now they face this punishment, we would be more than happy to take the trade off that overall, like these perpetrators of genocide, are that they are not named in the annals of history, then that some people, like are, that some people are, are are unfairly punished. We think that that's a fine trade off given the like intensity of the impacts that we name. We also hear kind of this characterization that I think just doesn't stand in this debate, which is that like, oh, in some places they'll still know this person, but known for other things. I don't know that that fits. I don't think that this fits into this motion. I think that clearly like. This is like this necessarily kind of has to be a global thing where you uh, like where, where everyone kind of where collectively as as a, as a world you, this person is not remembered. It can't be that in one place this person is known for things and another place they're they're known for other things. I think that that's just disingenuous with the spirit of the motion. What else do we hear? We hear some very important ideas after that for about the importance of justice, the importance uh, the importance of justice uh, when when discussing genocide. What's important here? They tell you that you need to know the person in order to get justice. I think that this was not properly proven by opening opposition. I don't actually understand why it's important to know the individual that perpetrated like, or perpetuated this genocide in order to get justice for what happened. I think that like, this is just not actually a claim that's proven like, by, by opening opposition. But more importantly, I think that what we do is far more in keeping with the principle of justice. And I'm going to extend on Vic's point here a bit, where we tell you that um, you know, death is not enough, that this is a much harsher punishment because you are not remembered at all. The one thing that, like, you know, that death itself is, it, 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 it is not final enough that we say that this person has no, that there's no memory of this person, that this person, it's, that this person is never remembered. But crucially, this is a form of reparation, of reparative justice, because the genocide stripped this ability from millions of people, families that were destroyed, that those people, there's no longer a memory of them, that they are lost, that their memory, that their legacy is lost. The only way to do justice to those victims, the only people to, that the only way to repay those victims is to say, we are not allowing this person who stripped you of that most human of things, which is to be remembered, we are not allowing that person to be remembered by anyone. They are not allowed to have a legacy. They are not allowed to be known. That is justice, and that is retributive. We then hear this conception about reparations, where again, I don't think that I just don't think that this fits into this motion. Like you know the countries that per, like, perpetuate that perpetrated the genocide. You know the victims of the genocide. The actual fact that you don't know the names of the individuals within history within the textbook doesn't mean that you can't seek reparations for a genocide. I don't think that they actually um, explain that. I think that we tell you that the principle of reparation is stronger on our side when it's a more retributive form of justice. But furthermore, they tell you that genocide is incredibly personal, um, and that it's, um, that, that it's important that people know the names of, of, of the perpetrators. A few things here. First of all, like they tell you it's important to know the name of a foot soldier who like was who, who, who committed a genocide. I think that this just is not how genocides are taught or understood. People generally don't know these people, the individual names of the people who like who were foot soldiers uh, in the Nazi army. You know Adolf Hitler. Why is this bad? This lends itself to a worse understanding of genocide because they say in their speech that genocides are largely 
perpetrated by individuals. And while we think that we still gain on the side, like it's still understood that this was done by individuals, whether or not we have their names doesn't actually matter. Like it, it doesn't actually matter on this side. But, but the trade-off here, I'll take in a second, the trade-off here is that on our side, it's very comfortable in when, when educating about uh, genocide to pin it on one person. Say that this person was like just especially evil, that this person had an evilness to them, and that they, um, that that is the reason the genocide happened. In fact, we think it's a better understanding, like a more complete understanding, to examine the like actual factors that lead to a genocide, the systemic ways genocides are perpetrated, the debate tells you this. But moreover, I think it actually doesn't matter whether you think that this is like a more correct conception of a genocide. What's actually important is that pedagogically, this is a better way to teach genocide because within countries, people are often think, well, there's no way an individual here will rise up and do this and be that evil. But people don't often think, people can't often identify the signs of these are the systems that create genocide, these are the circumstances that create genocide. Your farmer able to do that on our side, yeah? Yeah, there's many compelling things about Winston Churchill, but most of the people who really like how good he was at war probably don't like the ideology behind the fact that he killed like 7 million of my ancestors. I think that, um, well, okay, I think a few things. I think that this is like somewhat like uncomparative in that, in, in our, on our side of the house, like, uh, it's it, 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 it's just unclear what, what what changes here. Like if 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 we understand like it, or if we understand Winston Churchill as a perpetrator of genocide, then on our side he will be punished for that. The comparative is if he's not understood as a generator a, perpetu- a, a, a perpetrator of genocide, that on, on our side, then it's the same impacts that happen on your side. Where he's like so so it, it's not it, it's it, it, there's the, the the difference here the margin here is unclear to me. Um, but we also tell you, and I think that this is crucially needs to be responded to far better, that fascist movements or neo-fascist movements or fa- uh, movements that result after a genocide are, are built on the fact of glorification of the past. They're built on, the, uh, uh, on, on this. And when you have a person who is hated, who they say, you know, you don't shame these people. When these people are hated, that allows for people in the future to relate to that hatred, to say, well, the same groups hate me, and so I understand the perspective of this person. We tell you that we need to, we need to avoid that, we need to avoid the glorification to not just pre- pre- prevent genocides, but also rat acts of terror against perpetrated groups. So correct. brought up criminal justice. I'm a criminology student, so what I know is that meaningful justice comprises of a restoration to the previous state, making sure these things don't happen again, and punishment. The most hard line that Gov can defend, and their terminal thing, is that these people have done things that are so bad that people don't deserve to have them remembered. They should be stripped from history. I think then doing this necessarily comes at the trade-off of not performing all the things that actually makes justice meaningful. Why does then justice have to mean something and why does it not mean anything when it comes from Gov's side? I think it comes at the trade-off of an entire country forgetting because this is the function that forgetting fulfills. Because in forgetting the name, you necessarily forget the story. It's really hard to just remember some guy with some vague details that you read about in a history book. I know genocide is quite bad, but when you can't see it as tied to a specific context or very specific Specifically, it's very difficult to picture in your head how these things happen, so you tend to gloss them over. But it's also very hard to remember the specific importance of these things until you have a name to pin it to, until you can see the background in which they grow up to. But I think the second problem with this is that you don't need this to provide you dignity, and that forgetting in itself is not a dignified action. Because the problem that most victims have isn't remembering the name of who killed their family members. It is that their family members do not have justice. It is that they don't like have a way to get back what was lost from them. I think the closer way to do this is to not forget these sorts of things because the problem with the act. Better than forgetting their name, we argue it probably matters more the justice, like the types of justice that are only possible with identification, which is why Crystal's case on reparations is so important. At their best, the forms of justice they talk about don't mean much, but if you weigh this against Crystal's other argument, if you don't even say the name of the person that hurts you, I think this is actually an affront to the people that like you do this to. This person was so prominent in their lives, it feels weird to not acknowledge it at all. How 
then do you only achieve punishment and reparations on our side of the house? The problem with Nick's POI is that liability is really specific, in that you can say what happened to the victims, but if you are unwilling to name the people or connected to their families, you then cannot ask them to do things like pay back the money, which is the only way these people can like get some sort of justice back, right? Because these people, these genociders, are like often dead, so the only pe way that people can get reparation or to get some semblance of their self back is if you continuously exert pressure and are able to trace this line and tell them to pay money from that person's estate, identify specific squadrons that did sort of things, which leads to a bigger industrial like complex, and to get them to give you money this way. But the problem is, when you don't know who they are or who their estates are, it's very difficult to hold like accountability at large. Presumably how this works in opening government is you say, in some country somewhere, this sort of thing happens. But if you say this, then you can't identify any one person that has to pay up and do these sorts of accountable things. Because most countries will then say, if you can't even name a person, or like this was just some case, that these are a like minority of cases or a clear exception for which the entire country cannot be held accountable. You need to do the things like identify specific foot soldiers and to identify specific squadrons so that you can get this form of collective responsibility because unless it is specific, it is very difficult for justice to ever take hold. I also want to explain then why this is, policy is unnecessary to de-glorify and why you fulfill the uh, <clears throat> um, issue of like, what, what's it called? Um, learning better on our side of the house, which is the, preventing these things from happening again. I think the problem with their argument on deglorification is that genocide is a very contested title, right? Because the point at which you have identified a person as a perpetrator of genocide means the point at which people know that what this person was doing was bad. So you already perform this function of shaming, right? Because people see the label of genocide and generally feel a moral impulse. They know that killing many innocents is bad. So when you are able to frame a person as doing this, they know that something bad has been done. But this also means that there's a wide degree of social consensus that outweighs this glorification because genocide is contested. You pass the point of contestation about whether this person is a genocider. Most people, like, you've lost the power to convince people you were doing the right sort of thing, which means that this is the point at which radical groups are less likely to infiltrate, which then means the problem is on replication. Why is replication a lot worse on their side of the house? I think the thing you get with identifying things and identifying specifics is you are able to see it when it happens again. If you see them using symbols of a specific genocide, doing it in the familiar places, this serves as a signal to you that this is thing that is happening again. This thing that we are already labeled as bad is being replicated by other groups and being used in a really, really destructive way. However, it's very difficult to understand things when they are divorced from their context. So someone could be using the same strategies as in history before, but if mm, strategies as in history before, but because you haven't recorded the symbols used, you are unable to identify this is the same strategy at play again versus if people build on the frameworks that previously exist it is a lot easier to do so sure. uh, yeah go ahead was Hitler's strategy based on aesthetics like photos of him or the swastika or was it based on political and cultural messaging that we cover in our education I think this is like weird because surely it is a mix of both but it's like I think Obviously, like it was based on things like specific symbols. It was like on who he was as like a German person and like on his charisma as like some guy as like Hitler. So it's like you had a huge degree of personalism here that affected the way these things worked and very specifically led to specific strategies there. If you aren't able to identify these things when they happen again, I think this is really, really harmful. But more on this thing about learning. I think learning is really, really important because apart from the thing on reparations, which I think just cannot be claimed on their side of the house, there's no way to get the sort of specific liability there because countries generally don't want to be collectively responsible, is this problem of learning. Just think about this. Like, when when you say things that are just case studies, the opposite happens. Because when it is a specific person, we generally are quite critical of the great actors theory, right? This is what Crystal ends up weighing up. When it is one great actor, you ask yourself questions like, how did this person rise to such annals of greatness? Like, how was it possible that this one big name ended up like this? Versus if you was just a case study or a nameless sort of thing, you can't do the same sort of questioning about how these sorts of things are linked. Because an identity forces you to ask questions about like how this identity came to exist. You can't ask those same questions. So that path to history is just really, really cut off on their side of the house. It's unclear how they get this sort of thing. But the last sort of thing is on the moral harm that Crystal says about like memory in other sorts of places. Presumably their sort of thing is you want to wipe this out completely out of the minds 
of people where it is like because it is bad for anyone to hold a conception where this person is good i think this works a, worse on their side of the house when the only conceptions of these pe people where genocide is contested are the glorified interpretations right because genocide is contested you can't agree when it is happening which is why icj cases very seldom go through this means that the best sorts of memories of this person are the glorified ones people remember this person as a great person whereas the people who already know it is bad don't get any sort of like like justice the thing is that most genocides probably aren't necessarily like the Holocaust. They're usually during times of heightened conflict. There's usually when there's an active incentive to otherize people, when, when, when there's like an, when there is like heightened ethnic tension, when it's often both sides that are committing a lot of these atrocities, when it's often during literal like uh, when there's like deep rooted histories of like either like religious or like cultural differences and tensions, where you necessarily blame like the socioeconomic conditions that you're living in and are more willing to take up arms, usually in the global south where these are like the conditions that necessitate the amount of uh, that the the prerequisites to a committing genocide a lot of the time these are often not random sort of instances but rather like planned attempts of like remover of removal that have block broader societal like uh, motivations through things like socialization right the problem is is uh, in these instances it's usually not just a clear sort of like one like side is committing genocide and the other isn't it is often that in the, even in post genocidal societies it is very easy to facilitate things like violent sort of movements or retaliation, things like vigilantism against these sorts of things, often in counterproductive ways where you weaponize like the nature of the trauma that is associated with like these these experiences by literal story uh, t telling through like making like identifiable faces of like perpetrators and creating like evil versions of characters that you necessarily want to like otherwise that you necessarily want to like weaponize, right? The thing is that in vulnerable like post-conflict states where leaders can actively weaponize this rhetoric, where they have the incentive to do so insofar as like insofar as uh, like otherizing these people Per introduces like ethnic perpetrators and it cre allows for things like democratic black sliding where you don't necessarily where you don't necessarily need like approval of things like I don't know your Supreme Court where you necessarily don't uh, tap into like the same rights and like a, a promotion of things like equality for like different groups of people because that is an active incentive that you have when you're like when you're unlikely to do education even well on their side of the house I think these are the these are the cases in which this motion is probably most sort of pernicious these are the cases where it probably applies the most right I think on our side we can just say you make for better nation building and you prevent a significant amount of violence in the way in which genocide is going to be framed and in the way in which uh, in the way in which you're going to perceive this, right? I think the problem there is that in like post-conflict states that are often uh, violent, you probably have factionalized political power, right? What this means is that there's still like an ethnic majority or still like an ethnic group that might still have like positions of power, might still have access to a lot of the political systems and infrastructure. And there's also probably groups that have faced like genocide that you're actively trying, that are actively like within conflict, but still have to work together within political systems that often have to live next to each other, that often have to see each other every day. The only way that you can stop these people from literally killing each other into the future when there's ongoing tensions in these situations is to not give them literal faces of like people who are who have killed their families in the past past right the only way you can do it do this is often in situations where you are productively sort of like giving them like uh giving them sort of knowledge about these things right mm -hmm. and i think the problem then uh on Ops World is that it is very easy to weaponize a lot of these instances to create populism, to create like rhetoric to be like, oh, we need to take back what is ours and to perpetuate a lot of these cycles of violence. It's very easy to weaponize things like counter movements that are symmetrical to a lot of the acts of genocide that instantly, uh, that initially occurred that are equally probably as dangerous or if not, uh, if not just continuing like a lot of these things. I think that is probably the case that uh, that is most realistic on Ops World, right? What's the reason we prevent this, right? Because OG just necessarily says that, well, People are going to ignore like the deep-rooted causes that maybe facilitate this in the first place, and often these cases, these things are replaceable. With that, but they don't necessarily give us like an alternative of what like types of stories you're telling or how you're educating people, right? Other than like a history of a textbook where you might like erase a single name, I think when you focus on like a broader sort of like storytelling, I think this looks like two things. One, you focus more on like the victims at large and like the way in which that they've been affected, right? And I think one, this just makes for like a more sort of like nuanced sort of uh, and necessary countervailing force because I think in a lot of like history and this is engaging with the top half class that they actually like uh, that they focus the majority of their case on I think in these instances you're much more likely to give like um, you're much more likely to create sort of uh, like I don't know uh, some representation of minorities that are often discredited right I think you have every incentive on their side to easily to like talk about like the cults of personalities and like the uh, 
and like the individual motivations. And, and, and top five frames in a way where it's like to empathize and understand, but in a lot of cases it can also be the opposite. It can be to literally pin like a group of people as like evil. It can be used to be, it can used to be like a weapon of like a, a weapon of motivating your population to like restore your, yourself back to when like your people were in power and were great, right? I think these are the instances where it's significantly much more harmful. I think on our side, you focus more about like the culture that existed prior to the genocide. You focus more about what was lost from people. You focus more about like the literal sort of like the, the ways in which they people existed uh, and like the things that they had to go through in, in these situations. I think what this means is that you justify like the counter sort of like the, the reparations often to genocide in a much more productive way because you channel this into rebuilding a lot of the things that were lost during these times rather than focusing on the evil things that other people were doing which are probably likely to facilitate significantly more tensions on their side of the house right i think what that then means on our in our world is that you're much more likely to focus on things that are probably going to be uh, either at the very least not promoting like significant tension in the future where you can actually like nation build you can actually like i don't know create some degree of political power that you trust you can uh, and uh, it's very important to note that like most of these states are probably just also just prone to like uh, are prone to like uh, and, like uh, prone to bad like sort of accountability and easy to weaponize, right? I think in these instances, it's probably most productive and most beneficial to create these sorts of representations, right? The extraneous things then that we get out of uh, top five, actually, I'll take a few away from it before. Not naming someone glorifies them even more because we generalize groups. It was all Germans, actually. Individuals are fallible and difficult to glamorize or aestheticize. No, because if you say that it is a specific like branch of the militia, or like if you just literally focus on the people who had their lives like lost or like had had uh, I don't know specific experiences that they had to go through where they I don't know were literally not able to like practice their religion or some shit, that you probably focus on re like restoring that to those people. I don't know. Like I I, I don't think that that's intuitive. The second thing then is just I don't know. I think like the the entire idea out of op bench about or out of o about how this is uh, people are going to disagree on genocide and how there's different framing. I think one just assuming feasibility. I think it's going to be probably one relatively clear cut. But two, I don't get what the delta here is, right? I don't necessarily need to frame Churchill as like a genocide or maybe, but maybe I can just say that he's someone who induced famine on like my fellow Indian brethren for political and economic reasons. Why is there like a specific need to like like uh, to claim that this was a genocide and then like wash uh, and, and then to like wash it? I think you can use it strategically, but also I think given like the time frame, I. I think you're probably much more likely to be able to even do this when it is feasible enough, when there is enough people who are like willing to do it and want to actually like, uh, like, uh, implement a lot of these things, right? Or like, just believe in it. But the second thing is that I don't know. Like, I think when I like tell a story about genocide, and this is filling in like the crucial gap, I think the way in which you're likely to represent it is through like much more like artistic and like productive like means, things like movies, things like, uh, like books. I think these things are much are far far greater like uh, are far more likely to focus on like the nuances of how these things are occurring and prevent them in the future of Thank you Mr. for the wonderful speech. Turning my speech in three, two, one, go. Um, go ahead. I think that's something that has been, I think, left out of this round quite a bit, is the importance that historical genocides play in the activity that we engage in today, in the politics that we have today, and how important it is that this history is perpetuated regardless of the cost. So, I'm first going to frame a few things that I don't think we get from the other teams in this round. And the first thing is that the key issue with ancient history specifically, and I think that the uh, issue we'll get from closing government is that this is not relevant anymore, however I'll bring up later that it is. Um, the main issue we get with a lot of historical genocides is that they are not kept in the public consciousness and there are no records to say that these things have existed because if you were committing a genocide you likely don't want um, a lot of evidence and if we're like going back far enough you simply don't have the means to record history as well. Um, so this means that any chance we have to keep the genocide in the public consciousness and in the, like, the minds of people who were not there to witness it and who do not have direct descendants, uh, or not, not direct descendants of the victims, is incredibly important. This is like for academics who are studying it. This is for the general public who needs to like avoid doing these certain things. This is so that we have the narratives of these things in our heads, at least, as things that we can avoid going forward. So, the reason why this is important is that a lot of the historical narratives around genocide are centered around a specific person. And the reason this is, is because the person acts as a shorthand for the atrocities they committed. So for example, we think of like Alexander the Great, who did actually commit a lot of atrocities, who was a rather bad guy. Um, we're able to remember this because Alexander the Great is a historical figure around which there's a lot of mythology and who's been kept in the public consciousness as a figure who is like in the canon. If he is erased from the canon, what we have is simply a description of his activities, which again, if we go through the ancient world, is something that's one, not unique to him. So he, there are many genocides. I think that we get this from Kitmore with the opening teams. I was not um, tracking this. But genocides are not always as dramatic as they are. They are incredibly common and perpetuated by multiple different agents. And so 
if we accept the premise that this is incredibly common, especially in the ancient world, and that the re way that we track them, especially after they, you know, ha like happened a long time ago, is by the people who are most myth mythologized coming out of them, that it's very important for us to keep these names in the public consciousness. Because if we allow them to sort of slip away, we simply have, like, perhaps the actions, and I think we hear this from one of the other teams, that you're able to look at the actions specifically. But my point is that once we get rid of the figure who is able to be mythologized, who is able to be looked at, even in a positive and emulating light from people in history, at that point, we lose the ability to gain any of the other stuff. So if, for example, Alexander the Great, I'm gonna keep using him because he is in the time period that I need. Um, <laughs> if we allow him to sort of like, sure, we forget his name forever, we take it out of the records, no one idolizes him because we take the OG premise and we say that yes, these people, like once we get rid of the name, will in fact be forgotten. Um, at that point, the people who are keeping this history going and who are progressing it, for better or for worse, are the people who follow him and consider him an idol. And so, if we value keeping the history around and we believe that we can gain anything from these records, which we can, even if they are biased, because that tells us how people who committed genocide talk about people who are committing genocide about and the like things that they consider and the things that they're thinking about, which is important for helping us identify modern genocides. Um, at the point at which we have people who are willing to propagate this because they see this man as someone who deserves to be recorded in history, they are the people who are doing the bulk of the like clerical and like record keeping work for us so that Otherwise, this historical record is simply going to fall out of play because as history progresses, we simply have a lot of these instances taking place. And there's no way for us to have the same amount of like security in terms of will this genocide be considered in the future? Will people remember this? Will it be another thing that falls to history? Because frankly, there are a lot of genocides for which we don't have the names that are attached to them, which do fall to history. You know, people tried to like commit genocide on like the Mormons a whole bunch of times. No, we don't, because there were no historical records about it that mentioned anything really interesting or relevant, and they happened so often that they blended together. So at the point at which we have history fanboys who are able to keep this going and we're able to steal from them and take that uh, information in order to like you know not repeat what they're doing i think it's important to note that even though the information is saved by this group who we necessarily don't want to aid um there's no specific reason why that information is evil and why it is inherently one that is going to propagate more genocides instead of one that can be used and like reappropriated for our own personal purposes so um going on to yeah I think it's important to, again, hammer home why these people are sort of a shorthand for the things that they commit. And I think that's mainly because, like, there's only so much information that we're able to hold in our heads and digest, especially when it comes to, like, thinking about historical incidents, and especially when we come to think about atrocities, because regardless of whether we like it or not, I think that it is difficult for people to digest the things that we as humans have, like, done in the past, uh, and don't like thinking concretely about the actions that we have committed. However, at the point at which we're able to condense that into the figurehead of the person and able to shorthand to, like, yes, they committed genocide, this is the person who did it, um, like, yeah, the history is there, but also, like, this is a much easier way to have all of that information carried forward for us and at least retain in some form uh, that does not expect people to remember the specifics of this um, historical event. Um, so I want to do a little bit of mitigating for opening government. So I know that I mentioned earlier in my speech that um, the if we take opening government at the best and say that this um, act of forgetting or washing someone out of history is in fact the most effective, um, and it is going to work every time because it like makes people um, not idolize them. Um, yeah, wait, hold on. My handwriting is a little messy here. Um, yes, um, I think that the general push from that is that taking someone's name out of history is generally degrading or punishing, but this is not inherently so. We think that in terms of looking forward to modern genocides, and this is what I'm going to spend the last bit of my speech on, um, is that it's likely that people who commit genocides, um, one, have already done the comparison that they think what they're doing is worthwhile. Because I think, as opening of mention, it is quite visceral to kill another person. Um, however, if we're looking at uh, I'm going to kill this person versus I don't want my name like, erased from history, I think that it's likely to go still with the first option and not going to tip the scales that much. Secondly, um, I think that it's not inherent that this thing is a degrading act. I think that people who commit genocides are just likely to see the erasure of their absence from history as a form of glory and take it in stride, especially if this is something that we look at back throughout history. Um, there's nothing sort of inherently glorious about having your name there, but if you say, oh, I'm going to be erased from history for this, sure, that's fine too. And so, if we look then that if we look at the future genocides, we know that this erasing them from history is not going to deter any future genocides. 
uh, because people who commit have already like weighed the checks and balances, this is unlikely to be like a huge deterrent for them. And secondly, if we remove like the amount of knowledge that we have about these historical genocides, we are unable to prepare better for future ones. And the only way we can do this is if we make the history accessible, if we make it something digestible, and if we make it something that's able to be carried on. If we do that for modern genocides as well, we have that information going forward. And this is important, especially when we consider like how information is stored and how permanent things are. Ultimately, the best and most secure way to store history is within the minds of the people who tell it over and over and over again. And so we need that to happen, we need that to continue, and we cannot rely on any other measure for avoiding genocide in the future. Thank you so much for your See how straw man's case, so let me begin by clarifying. I have a simple question for you. In which world am I more likely to engage in a revenge killing for a genocide that has occurred in the recent past? Is it a world in which all I know is that the, this particular ethnic group did a genocide onto my particular ethnic group? Or is it a world in which I know the name, in which I can reasonably speak and find the address, in which I know the face of the individual who killed an important member of my community, perhaps my mother, perhaps a friend, etc.? There is obviously a delta in terms of how likely it is for there to be revenge killings that then spiral into further revenge killings because of course there could be revenge killings for the revenge killing this can easily get out of control and for that reason violence can reignite in the regions that are the most prone to violence in the status quo we should care the most about preventing the reoccurrence of genocides in these regions where governments are the least equipped to prevent them from spiraling out of control that was our case very broadly speaking let's talk about everyone else's cases let's begin with CO CO says that the big threat in this debate is that people are going to forget genocides in the absence of having the specific names of the perpetrators. First, I have no idea why there's a tipping point here. There are other many strong, there are other strong reasons to remember genocides and to have them feature prominently both in history and in pop culture at large. Oftentimes, genocides are just simply really historically important for explaining other events. And so, if you want to explain other events, you have to oftentimes have to explain the genocide. Similarly, many people are uh, continue to be affected by the lasting legacies of genocides. Oftentimes, they explain sort of where people are located in the world. And so, there's just tons and tons of reasons. Many people have personal reasons to care about genocides. So I have entirely no clear why I'm entirely unclear why it is that we necessarily need the names in order to remember genocides. Also, this is a this house would, not a this house prefers. I really don't care at all about Alexander the Great and what we can learn from him. No one's learning anything from him in the status quo. Let's be real. Okay. But let's actually continue on this last point here, because I'm really unclear like how many genocides I need in my mind at any particular point. Like the average person doesn't vote on the basis of more than two genocides. They vote on if at all. They vote on the basis of whichever genocide was most recent and most relevant to the conflicts and to the issues that their country is feeling in the status quo. So even if they have a delta, again, I think that they're just getting superfluous uh, genocides into the public consciousness. I have no idea why this is something that I should be voting on in this debate. Lastly, I think their whole case can be taken up quite easily. They say that what you need is a person as a shorthand for a genocide. This is where my stuff on victims comes into play, because we explain why a big part of the counterfactual uh, is having the elevation of victims and their names and their identities. So you can also have a victim as shorthand for a genocide. All their analysis on why people as shorthand is so effective also applies to our side. You can have and Frank as shorthand for the Holocaust rather than having Hitler as shorthand for the Holocaust. There is absolutely no delta on CO, but I'm sure Cam is going to uh, rebuild this into a win. Okay, let's talk about every other team in this room, starting with OG. So OG says that we need to prevent the glorification of individual perpetrators. There's really an unclear delta here because I'm very entirely unclear why you can't glorify genocidal movements at large. They never meaningfully fill this gap. Next on education, they say that it's important to look at the structural causes. Let's be a little bit more nuanced here because the status quo teaches the history of genocides, not in one way or the other, but in a nuanced way. Like it has some explanation of the causes of a genocide, some explanation of like the individuals and their individual stories, at least as far as the perpetrators are concerned. So the delta here is what happens to that section of history that is currently focused on individuals. Insofar as there's a revealed preference to have part of history be focusing on individual stories, we think it's highly likely for the society and for historical institutions to switch that section of history into analyzing the individual stories of individual victims. This is obviously good, not only because it creates empathy for these victims, but it also creates knowledge of these victims and how the genocide currently affects them in the status quo today. And this increases both the desire to help minorities uh, and then broadly speaking, like the capacity to do so as well. Insofar as these minorities are often excluded from history and the status quo, we broadly speaking fix, the, fix this. But even if you don't buy any of that, all this education stuff is really a wash. O OG says we need to look at the structural causes. O says we need to look at individual information of individual lives. I don't know who to believe. Probably go with the possibility of many people dying. That's what we give you on CG. Next, the OG talks about the principle here. Um, I'm just going to knife them for a bit. I'm entirely unclear why this is principally good. You aren't punishing anyone. They are dead. They are non-existent. They're a non-entity. This is not an act of punishment. This equally applies 
applies to O's responsibility analysis, and so in that way, this isn't a knife you can credit it. <laughs> Lastly, on deterrence. I think CEO has already dealt with this sufficiently, but damnatio memoriae is such a far-off speculative possibility for someone that it's entirely unclear how the extent to which it's going to feature into people's decision-making calculuses, and thus why someone who's actively considering engaging in genocide would possibly be changed on our side. Lastly, they say that in Ops world, you can pin a genocide on a specific bad apple. Again, I'm entirely unclear on the Delta here. Why can't you pin on an anonymous bad apple in Ops world? I think OG, broadly speaking, suffers from a lack of comparativeness. Before going to OO, I will take a POI from them. You simultaneously say that these guys are dead, but also that there's fucking revenge killings, so presumably only one of them can be true. Uh, no, so the point is that uh, OG stuff on punishment doesn't really work, um, but there's many people who are perpetrators of genocides who are also alive in those cases. So obviously OG stuff doesn't work because, or maybe it does, but I don't know. All right, I guess that's just weighing OG, like weird. Okay, cool. All right, let's talk a little bit about OO. So the first thing they say that often there's disagreements over whether there's genocide, as Mai has already explained, I think assume feasibility probably captures us here and so we're fine. Next, OO says that victims can't speak up in our world. We explain why broadly speaking they can speak up against genocidal movements and why it's probably better for them to do so because when victims have access to the specific Information of those who wrong them or people like them, they're likely to not just like peacefully request uh, uh, reparations from the states, but instead oftentimes to literally go out and kill them because the simple reason is that genocide breeds hatred, understandably so. Oftentimes people want revenge, not money, and so it's far, and also as we explained, it's far better to try to get reparations from governments rather than getting reparations from individuals for all the reasons that Namai provided. Next, they say that you can't recognize a faceless entity as evil. Uh, we explain why this is probably a wash because sure, there's some benefits in terms of hating individuals more, but there's also benefits of empathizing with individuals individuals more. And so far as it's probably dangerous to put yourself in their shoes and try to understand why they did what they did. This can oftentimes cause you and many other people who are otherwise prone to genocidal ideology to sympathize with them. And so that, that's why that whole thing is a wash. Okay, great. A few more things on OLO. They say that you're, you're going to forget the story when it's vague. I think there's no delta here. And so far as I already proved where we're going to get a switching of the relevant part of the history to victims and name victims. This prevents vagueness. This, this keeps concretization symmetric. Lastly, they say that you can't get justice uh, from individuals but money to state stuff. I'm sorry. I already responded to that. Okay, great. Let's move on to our case and just very very quickly uh, do the obvious weighing here. I think that any individual revenge killing could be the spark that sets off a fire that could blow up an entire global south country. It is vitally important for us to minimize these amounts of killings to as little as possible. They give people the incentive and the capacity to go out and kill someone who maybe deserves death. We're happy to concede that this perpetrator deserves death, but what, but all the innocents that will be caught up in the crossfire if this act spirals out of control via revenge on revenge on revenge, none of them deserve death. For that reason, I think the weighing is obviously quite clear. Both top half teams get too bogged down in the question of education and history. I think that in the regions that we're most concerned with, educational systems are pretty weak on both sides, and histor historical knowledge is already pretty weak on both sides in terms of there not being much uh, in the way of public information, especially that. And so this also applies symmetrically to CO. So for that reason, care the most about the worst impacts, which we've proven to be marginally more likely in their world when you know the name, you know the face, and per OO's own reasons, you are more likely to hate and hate more profoundly when you have that name attached. Do the damnation, Thank you. Thank you.